Welcome. This is Jennifer Armstrong, Associate Director for the National Center for Arts Research, or NCAR. Thank you for joining us for an overview and discussion of NCAR's bottom line report. Today, NCAR Director Zani Voss will walk you through some top level report findings, followed by a conversation with Propel Nonprofits President and CEO Kate Barr. We'll then open it up for questions. A few housekeeping notes, you will be on mute during the presentation and discussion. Following the discussion, if you have a question, you can use the raise hand button in the top left of your Zoom window. I will unmute you and invite you to introduce yourself and to ask your question. This webinar should run less than an hour. And if you are so inclined, please tweet with us using hashtag artsbottomline. So with that, I'll turn it over to Zani. Thank you, Jennifer, and a very warm welcome to Kate Barr, President and CEO of Propel Nonprofits, and I'm really honored to be able to share this time with you, Kate. It's fun to be here. Thanks. So here's what we're going to do. Um, I'm going to give a brief overview just about the data that, uh, that we analyze here at NCAR, and then we're going to do a, a top-line view of the bottom-line report. And for those who are interested, you can see here um, as the National Center for Arts Research's uh, website, what the address is. And to find the bottom line report, you just click on where it says new, the NCAR bottom line report. Then we're going to open up for uh, discussion and questions. So let's get started about the data. Uh, at NCAR, we have pulled together a variety of different uh, sources of data because what we're trying to do is model the arts and culture ecosystem. Uh, we have linked organization level data uh, on a very broad basis from uh, IRS 990s. We have a deeper dive of data from our close partners, Data Arts, from uh, Theater Communications Group, League of American Orchestras, uh, box office level data from TRG Arts, which spills over into the community uh, data, and uh, Opera America. We've taken every organization and linked it to its community characteristics. Uh, so linking it to the Census Bureau data, knowing who lives near the organizations, um, what other businesses operate nearby, what's the level of competitive uh, concentration of arts organizations in a community, and what's the availability of public funding. Uh, so we have data from the NEA, IMLS, and National Assembly of State Arts Agencies. Uh, we do this because we believe that uh, part of what drives organizational performance is not only who you are, but where you operate. We have some wonderful thought partners who've worked with us over time, including BCG, Rebecca Thomas Associates, and IBM. And we're going to focus here in looking at 2016 data and some averages related to bottom line. So we're going to have a heavy focus today looking at the organization level data. The big question is, do arts and cultural organizations bring in enough money to cover expenses? That's what we have uh, as the highlight of this report. And in 2016, we look at bottom line three ways. If we look at the, over, the unrestricted surplus before depreciation, in 2016, that was 2.1%. And under this rubric, uh, unrestricted surplus, uh, it, it's the figure that you see in most financial audits. It includes operating revenue plus some not operating funds like investment gains and losses or, or capital campaign proceeds. If we take out in, uh, th those non-operating revenue figures and we just look at the same thing but for operating surplus before depreciation, on average for all our certain cultural organizations in the data, we have uh, just above break even, kind of about break even at 0.4% of budget. And when I talk about as percent of budget, we're taking what was the bottom line relative to total expenses. If we add in depreciation though, the figure comes down to an operating deficit of 4.2%. And here just sharing with you what the averages are for unrestricted surplus, 40,000 on a $1.9 million budget. Uh, operating surplus before depreciation is only $8,000 on a $1.9 million budget. And then you can see the effect both on expenses and uh, bottom line when it comes to the addition of depreciation. So this was 2016, but what about what's happened over time? If we take a four-year view, we see that the four-year trends overall uh, was that bottom lines became increasingly um, dire over time and incre increasingly constrained. Uh, what we know is that 
even if you look at the most constrained and conservative view of bottom line, including depreciation, it went from a positive 2.2% in 2013 down to a negative 6.1% by 2016. So this is a somewhat smaller cohort than what we looked at in the 2016 data. These are organizations for which we have data for every year. And for those organizations in 2016, uh, bottom line was negative no matter how you sliced it. So let's look, does it matter by arts and cultural sector? We see that this is because uh, the revenue growth fell short of expense growth, which exceeded inflation. That's why it's, uh, it's been the downward trend. By sector, we see differences. Uh, we see that the arts and cultural sectors of these 11, the five with comparatively lower average budgets, uh, that would be arts education, community-based organizations, music, uh, which includes everything from choruses to jazz ensembles, um, anything that's not a symphony orchestra, uh, opera, uh, theater, and general performing arts, all averaged a positive bottom line in 2016 by all three measures. Uh, operating bottom line actually trended upward for both the music and the theater and general performing arts sectors, as opposed to that downward trend that we saw for the other sectors. On the other end of the spectrum, we see here that art museums and symphony orchestras ended 2016 with an average negative bottom line by all three measures. And we're going to want to talk about that a little bit later. If we pulled together all arts and cultural organizations and said, let's not look by sector, let's just say by size. So small versus medium versus large, which of course has a different cutoff point if you are a small dance company versus a small art museum, that's going to represent a, diff a different budget cutoff. But what we see is in terms of size, uh, the larger the organization, the more likely it was to end 2016 with a deficit, regardless of the bottom line calculation. On the other hand, smaller organizations demonstrated the highest bottom line in 2016 by any measurement. And with that, I'm going to open up uh, just a broader discussion uh, with Kate. Let's talk about some of these findings. I, I want to start off just with the notion that NCAR does examine bottom line three different ways, and that's not intended to confuse people and, and say, oh, it all just depends. It's to say that Really, how you look at bottom line depends on what's in the revenue side and what's in the expense side um, that you use in the calculation. Uh, you know, for the unrestricted surplus, that's really, as I said, what most people see in financial audits with the operating uh, two measures we are looking at. Let's strip away anything that's non-operating and just focus on what's going on in terms of revenue brought in for operations. And lastly, we add in depreciation. Um, Kate, can I ask you just to talk a little bit about the importance of considering the effects of depreciation? Why should you pay attention? Yeah, I am. I'm glad to be asked that because first, just let me chime in with my uh, appreciation for the fact that NCAR does look at bottom line in these three different ways because um, it's, it's really easy to use just that first one, one, the one that's really on that financial report or on the audit report and say, well, that's the number. But taking out the non-operating capital campaigns, special funds like that makes it really kind of more the operating budget. But I am an absolute, I don't know, a word other than evangelist for thinking about depreciation and to be really cognizant and aware of the fact that even though it's a non-cash expense, so it looks like it's just kind of paper, so it doesn't matter. The fact that if you, if you are depreciating your building or your renovation or even your computer, your, your information technology infrastructure, at some point you're gonna to have to replace them. At some point you are gonna have a new cash need. And when you're not really thinking about depreciation, when you're not factoring it in and including it at least in some way in your budgeting or your financial planning, what you're doing is that you're putting your head in the sand and not paying attention to in the future, you're going to have a real cash problem. Whereas if for organizations that are able to incorporate it into their financial planning and build it in, they start to accumulate some cash and it's a powerful, powerful tool. Hmm. Thank you, Kate. It, it you know, makes me think of even from a, a personal perspective, if you have your car and uh, you, we know that it's depreciating over time and are you putting away enough money someday to replace it or repair it? Um, I'm, for arts organizations, it's just equally important 
to not get in that that crisis mode where your your assets are basically used and uh, how are you going to replace them right um, thinking about the findings when measuring bottom line even by unrestricted surplus so sort of the the rosiest of the three measures all of the, ex the sectors except for music and theater mirror the overall downward trends to varying degrees. Um, what do we think is going on? I mean, this is especially at a time when the economy has been fairly robust over recent years. I, I don't believe that it's, uh, you know, just a, a question of kind of a, a free for all in terms of spending. What do you think is going on? What are you seeing in your work? You know, I think that what, it, what this is, and, and here at Propel Nonprofits, we work with, we do a lot of work around finances and governance with nonprofits of all kinds, but have pretty in-depth uh, conversations and, and engagements with uh, arts organizations across the range of different kinds of sectors. And so we see this, and so the numbers that you have here really reflect what we have seen with our clients. And I think what's happening is that really what this tells you is the story of the way business models work that for arts for nonprofits, business models are much more than just the revenue. And too often when we talk about a nonprofit business model, the conversation all is around essentially how to raise more money or generate more ticket sales or more you know, um, payments for tuition or something. But mm -hmm. the business model is about a lot more than revenue. And when changing revenue, frankly, takes longer, there's a longer lead time to really make a shift in the, in the way that revenue comes in, whether it's raising more money from individuals, which requires, you know, kind of a different development function and staffing and communication or changing ticket sales, which requires a whole lot of marketing and audience understanding. So changing revenue takes longer. Changing expenses happens. And it happens and particularly in areas where organizations, you don't, it's not completely discretionary. If you have staff, and you pay health insurance, health insurance probably went up, or you're in a competitive labor market, and so you have to pay differently, or you have fixed expenses for your building, or for your other kind of operating expenses. So expenses tend to go up on a more predictable curve, and revenue is lumpier in its revenue, in, in its increases, because it takes this kind of a ramp up. It's, you go to plateaus. And so I think a lot of what we're seeing is the lag time in what it takes to build, to change revenue at a time where expense is just going up because of particularly labor costs and, and uh, other mm -hmm. HR related costs. That's interesting. There's been a lot of talk um, at the Theater Communications Group uh, Fall Forum this year. Rog Schulfer, the Goodman Theater's executive director, gave a really powerful presentation about uh, Baumol and Bowen's cost disease. Yes. Basically saying that because we're so labor intensive, we don't get the productivity gains uh, that drive efficiencies in a lot of other industries. They are just harder uh, to, to take advantage of in, in the arts. Uh, and what we saw is within the expense increase figures in this report is that most of the arts and cultural sectors experience similar growth rates and expenses, meaning that they outpaced inflation, growth and expenses outpaced inflation by about 10 to 15% over the four-year period. Mm -hmm. uh, and they didn't decrease for any sector. The art museums and dance sectors actually had um, even higher growth, above 20% uh, before and after depreciation. So it just kind of highlights and, and underscores for me um, your comments about the increases in some areas that we really are essential to our operations. Yeah, and I think that one of the other things that you see, particularly with, you know, community organizations and music, when that's more the, the non-symphonies, non is that one of the other big differences between different type, different sectors within the arts is the planning time, the planning time frame, the planning horizon. You know, museums, for example, and, and uh, symphonies and operas plan far, far in advance, which means that those expenses for an exhibition or a season are really determined several years in advance, or at least a, a couple of years in advance. Whereas for community-based arts organizations, they're planning more um, at a shorter term. They're planning maybe one year out or maybe even six months or season by season, which means that they can flex more, they can adjust more to whatever the revenue they have available. Mm -hmm. And you know that 
reminds me of the findings that we saw with respect to large organizations that you know they had seen a steady decline in bottom line by all measures. Uh, and the sharpest decline was actually seen by looking at unrestricted surplus. Uh, with large organizations, is part of what you're seeing um, as the cause of those declines uh, just kind of being tied because of the longer term planning horizon or what else might you attribute that to? I think it's the, it's the longer term planning horizon certainly has a big effect. The fact that their expenses are so very fixed, both with museums in particular in terms of the cost of their facilities, but also maintaining their collections and just the cost of maintaining exhibition space. And there's a certain fixed cost there. And symphonies, because of the size of the symphonium and the Baumol's cost diseases, you know, it, it kind of came out of the idea that a string quartet six, takes the same four people as always. Um, and the fact that they are heavily um, have, have negotiated labor contracts that get fixed and advanced with, with benefits built in. Um, one of the analogies I have made sometimes when I've talked about this, you know, it, this is true for, this, for the sectors, but it also reflects the sizes of organizations because these are common, is that the bigger organizations, the institutions like art museums and symphonies are kind of like a pipe organ where you can't just move it. You got to re, you have, it, it takes a long time to remodel a building that has a pipe organ in it. And some of these smaller organizations like community-based and um, community-based and music organizations and even many dance companies and arts, arts education, they're more like accordions where they can expand and contract and expand and contract quite quickly, which means that it's much easier for them to adapt and change and reduce expenses quite quickly when they have different revenue or expand. Whereas it takes a, an, an art museum an enormously long time and this isn't just about revenue, of course, it's about their whole relationships with their communities, which, we're, which we know a lot about. Right, so it's the nimbleness question of right. how, how able are they to, to change course. So we see with the small organizations, they've seen the largest increase in bottom line over time, um, you know, that they, on the surface of only looking at bottom line, uh, seem to be in a healthier position. It could be just that, uh, they're breaking either because they have no choice but to break even, uh, you know, otherwise they'll, they'll just go out of business. I think that's exactly the case. They have no choice. Mm -hmm. They don't have the really the, they don't have the cash reserves and the endowments and the investment portfolios that allow them to really have more than a very short term deficit because they don't, they don't have the means to survive if they did. And so they don't have a choice, which means that they do have that nimbleness and that ability to make quick decisions that, you know, if you're, if you're going to do a, 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 a series of workshops or a series of programs in your arts education, you maybe use staff instead of contracted teachers and you do other things to manage the expenses or to really hew closely to the revenue that you have available. But you're right, they don't have, they don't have the availability. And, and when you, um, you know, I know that one of the NCAR does work in many different parts of the the financial and organizational structure of organizations. And so when we match this study up with some of the work that you've done around capital, for example, and balance sheets, I think that then you'll see a fuller story because the arts museums and the symphonies, for example, and the operas have the capital to allow them to live through, to survive times where they're really making major business model changes. Small organizations don't, so they don't have the choice. Okay. And we are you know, working currently on a report that will look at a variety of different ways at working capital, um, you know, by sector, by size, et cetera. Uh, and so it, it will be interesting to see what those analyses bear out in right. terms of looking at a, a bigger overall capital structure strategy. Right. And then when we correlate it with this, with this research, I think it'll be a really interesting full picture. Yeah. So... Knowing what we know, do you think that large organizations have something to learn from small organizations? Oh, actually, I do. I think that part of one of the things that large organizations can learn from small organizations is the question of how they can build some nimbleness into their planning cycles and into their planning time. And so I know of a, it's, it's more of a mid-sized organization, but that, 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 that's a performing arts organization that we work with that has decided to only plan a partial season. So they plan their season out. And instead of planning out a full season of plays, 
they're planning out about two thirds of their season and then they're leaving a couple of their shows for faster decisions, for shorter term mm. decisions. And this is both for financial reasons, but it's also an incredible luxury for the artistic director to be able to, you know, in today's you know, environment, for example, to do a fairly political play because there's a different choice that, that that artistic director will make now. So building that nimbleness and that flexibility into planning instead of planning everything out where you're fixing everything in, in the future. That's a really interesting example. Um, I wonder if there are organizations that uh, are out there who have owned a facility and have decided that they don't want to be in the facility ownership. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. situation in terms of nimbleness. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And having the, and when, when particularly the larger institutions, and we know this from other research and other just stories that we've read are really exploring how they can really operate differently with their audiences and their community. And that's going to require a different business model. And I think that what we're seeing here is that they do have the capital to do that. They're cap, they're well enough capitalized with their endowments and their cash that they can weather several years of this, but you know, they won't weather it forever. Right. You know, so I also think about, uh, there is a, an index that we look at called people per offering. And you know, part of that is examining what's going on in terms of number of programmatic offerings from an organization. And we saw over time that um, the average organization in every arts sector added programmatic offerings uh, at an overall rate of 15% over yep. four years. So, it, you know, it's also the continued, we love to add programs, but then we don't want to ever let them go once we've created them. You know, so it, also thinking about the, the nimbleness, are we willing to go back and ask the hard questions of, uh, you know, on a program by program basis, do we, are each of them still advancing mission in a, in a sustainable way? Right, right. Um, I want to think, talk just for a, a moment. We, we saw with the art museums and the symphony orchestras, uh, you know, looking at these two sectors, particularly with the art museums and the, the fixed assets, um, how do you see that having an impact you know, ultimately on bottom line and whether or not uh, just by the fact that they have a permanent collection, that they are for the long term stewards of a collection, you know, how that might affect uh, yes, they have the fixed cost, but then how would, it, how would it affect strategy overall? Well, I think that this is a very hot topic and keen discussion within the museum world right now because that is the question. And of course, there, there, are, there are some very well-established practices and protocols in museums around uh, their collection and whether or not the, that collection is that, that the fact that they are stewards of that long term which means that they have to have a business model built for permanence. And the question is, is how is that viable and how do they continue to build the, the donor support so that they can do that? And the museums that are really thriving and really relevant in their community are finding ways to have their collection be, finding ways to make their collections more relevant and finding ways to engage in their community differently while still being stewards of that collection or having different kind of partnerships, different kind of um, partnerships around exhibitions and use of the collection. But it's a, it's a, it is a very difficult business right now, museums. Hmm. Um, th thank you, Kate. It, you know, there's, there's so much to ponder here and we could keep going with discussion, but I wanna stop and make sure that um, we leave time, not only for questions, questions and, and comments, you know, we are observing what's going on in the field, but I'd love to invite uh, perspectives from those of you who are listening in, who are actually running organizations and either struggling to break even and you know, what's your experience or simply sharing how you have been able to uh, reverse, go, go against trend. So once again, if you would like to ask a question, please use the raise hand button in the top left of your Zoom window. I will unmute you and invite you to introduce yourself and to ask your question. If you don't have a mic, you may send your question in the chat box.
And while people are maybe writing their first question, uh, because I certainly hope there will be uh, some feedback from those listening in, uh, I, I'm just going to, to go ahead and, and pose this question now. Uh, you know, where do we go from here? Uh, it, it's a, a question about, uh, you know, what can organizations do with this information uh, to help shape strategic direction moving forward? Do you have any thoughts related to that, Kate? Well, I think one of the very first things organizations can do is to share both this report and the, these findings as well as their own maybe trends, their own organizational four or five year trends internally with their leadership teams and with their boards of directors simply to start the conversation about why the bottom line matters. Because, you know, we are all still trying to break the habit and the kind of the the pretty bad best practice of break even budgeting and break even operations. And so the bottom line matters a lot. And the bottom line matters because this is how we how organizations can stay can can stay strong enough by building up some cash and having the ability to grow and to change. So part of it is just use the information and see how you compare how your organization compares to others within your sector, but then across the range and sizes. So that's one of the, the beauties of the the depth of the data on the report. And then is to talk about, so what's the future? You know, what, what, I think organizational trends will tell you a lot if you are able to do these three bottom lines for your organization. Do we have any questions or, or comments there, Jennifer? I do not see any hands raised. Again, if you want to use the chat box, you can use that as well. If there's, go ahead. I'm going to ask, a, I'm going to pose a question to, um, to use Ani as the researcher is when you look at this information, um, are there anomalies that stick out? I mean, I think that one of the things sometimes that happens too, when you look at research like this is an organization might say, well, yeah, but you know, that's because, you know, the museums all have big endowments or because everybody wants to, 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 to do theater. So do you see anomalies? Do you see things that stick out that make you want to drill deeper? The, the, the things that really stick out to me, uh, and you know, I'll run all the analyses and, and create the, the charts and tables and then uh, stare at them for a really long time <laughs> and, and wait until I can really get a, a better sense of what story am I seeing in the through line of the, the, different, um, the different findings. You know, one of the things that really hit home for me was, uh, and it's related to your, your comment earlier about revenue, you know, is this a time where there is increased competition for attention? We know people are spending an awful lot more time uh, in a digital space. So is it increasingly more difficult to get people to come out and engage with the arts? And when they get there, what kind of experience are they having? So how much are the arts organizations um, working to do what they can on the expense side. Uh, how nimble are they allowing themselves to be? Because even if we look not only by sector and then look by size, but if we look by sector and size, within each of the arts and cultural sectors, the small organizations are the ones who are kind of bucking the trend. So how much is there to be said for this level of nimbleness? And I don't think you can save your way to uh, greatness, that it takes investment also in developing the, the revenue side. What's going on in terms of changing that revenue equation? You know, what kind of investments is the organization making in relationship development um, of getting people to come back a second time, increase the frequency, increase the recency? And you know, certainly one of our other partners is TRG Arts. And, um, I've talked with Jill Robinson about this extensively that, you know, the organizations uh, that are really kind of bucking the trend here, the, the what about X organization uh, that's doing so well, oftentimes is the one that is figuring out how to gain expertise in doing a in relationship development. Mm -hmm whether it's with, with members, with audience members, with, uh, with students, but not just having many, many touch points that are constantly turning, but how do you turn those touch points into something that's, uh, that's stickier with the organization? Mm 
Yeah. Yeah. And that, that, that corroborates what, what we see in our really successful organizations. Mm. Okay, we have a question from Alex, the Museum of Russian Art in Minneapolis. He asks, how can organizations best leverage the new tax code, specifically major gifts and corporate gifts, to address this issue in budgetary planning going forward? We can see stark negative trends, so I'm curious whether this is a tool to motivate larger gifts and or highlight why funding things like depreciation is important. Kate, would you like to start that or would you like me to? No, you go ahead. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I think that it's such a poignant question at this point um, and only time will tell whether or not this does or does not work in the favor of arts and cultural organizations. You know, there is uh, the Tax Policy Center. If you haven't visited their site, they have some excellent information out there. Uh, it estimates that the Tax and uh, tax Cuts and Jobs Act is going to shrink the number of households claiming an itemized deduction for their gifts to nonprofits from about 37 million to about 16 million in 2018. Uh, so that sounds like it's not going to uh, necessarily be something that's positive for the arts. Uh, organizations, you know, there's also been a lot written about bundling of contributions. So individuals may end up uh, giving in a larger way once every couple of years so that they can kind of pull together uh, their contributions to beat that threshold in one year, knowing that in the next year they probably won't be able to make it. Uh, you know, by doing that, certainly organizations that are able to attract the larger contributions will benefit from it. Uh, in, certainly those who are more on a multi-year funding uh, cycle with donors will be able to benefit from that. I fear for organizations that are really living kind of hand to mouth, month to month, in that from a cash flow perspective, um, you know, how do you manage that so that the, if bundling is going to be a trend in the future, uh, that you continue to maintain enough revenue for the off years when the level of, um, of giving may not be as high. Mm -hmm. it, it, at this point, you know, all we can really give is unscientific estimates. Uh, I wish I had a crystal ball to see exactly how this is going to play out. You know, a back of the envelope estimate uh, would be that, you know, the arts really will be losing out, um, as will other nonprofit sectors. Yeah, I'll chime in. First of all, hi, Alex. It's nice to hear from you and the beautiful Museum of Russian Art in Minneapolis. Um, I think that one of the one of the things about the tax reform that really proved is that non nonprofits had overplayed the tax deductibility as a part of the the um, motivation for contributions, and I think that maybe we should learn from that lesson. And you did specifically ask about major donors, which are likely to continue to be itemizers, and so I think then. To, to, to learn the lesson that says the tax deductibility has never been actually the primary motivation for donors. It, it potentially backfired in the last year. And so the question is, how can you just do great work establishing those relationships with people who care about what you do? And I think in particular, make the case for those major gifts and especially in a museum, how the collection, your ability to curate, your ability to really reach out in the community how it really is reliant on those donors, but it's always about relationships, right? And I think we can learn a lesson about not overplaying that deductibility piece. Yeah, which you know, ties right back into the comment about uh, revenue generation. You know, how do you get a, a loyal base of patrons, not just as donors, but perhaps also as uh, you know, those who are buying their memberships, those who are buying subscriptions for uh, performing arts. Uh, it, it, the, the relationship development is, is an important just for this year's purchases, but it's also for changing the conversation, the rubric around uh, making donations. Uh, individuals are such a key part of contributed funds for the average arts organization. This will really be key. Mm -hmm. We have another question. From Kathleen, we've spoken a lot about nimbleness. Have you seen larger organizations successfully move this direction? If so, do you know how this was implemented? 
Well, you know, I just cited the one example of the performing arts organization that decided to build in some unprogrammed time in their season schedule. So I can use that one, but I've, I've, I know I've talked to a couple of others and I know that the way it was done was essentially through leadership. So the leaders of the organization decided to do something that was probably a risk to say, we're going to do this differently and really build, started to build a culture that says, we're going to start to accept some uncertainty. We're going to be really intentional about it. Um, I know of one organization that actually built into their budget kind of an opportunity fund where they essentially were encouraging their staff members in each of the different areas to propose things that would be kind of a test, piloting more things, that kind of rapid prototyping that entrepreneurs talk about. And, but it really all starts with leadership. And then hopefully if you have some capital, here's one of the other benefits of capital, to be able to say, well, we, we actually have some financial resources to put into it. But it's, it's really all about intentional planning and saying, we're going to do this and we're going to accept the uncertainty around it. I, this isn't a, a specific example, but uh, there was a really wonderful article uh, that had talked about, I think the title of it was Entrepreneurship and Middle Management. And it, it talked about the difference between an administrative versus an entrepreneurial orientation and just raises the question of, um, if we stop and took stock of our resources, how much of it do we really need to own? You know, how much of it do we need to possess on a full-time permanent basis versus if we went through organization, are there aspects of what we do where we could uh, outsource rather than have everything in-house? You know, are there things that we can rent rather than own? Uh, you know, what's the extent to which we kind of have our hands tied behind our back in terms of fixed costs? Uh, perhaps because it gives us the flexibility to do what we want to do programmatically, uh, but it may also mean then that our hands are tied um, from making decisions about if revenue isn't coming in as we expected, what are we going to do to, to change the equation at the end of the year? Yeah, absolutely. And that's a, that's, a, that's a question that I will say is easier to ask when you're in the growth period coming up rather than when you already own the building and already own it all. It's much harder to ask than you have fewer. The, the options are very different and harder. Okay. Well, if there are no more questions, um, you know, where do we go from here as a field? I hope the answer is, is certainly up. Uh, they're incredibly talented. Uh, and experienced arts and cultural leaders who are out there uh, that are able to navigate these difficult waters. Uh, I want to thank everybody for their time and I give a particular and hearty thanks to Kate Barr uh, for sharing her wisdom with us uh, during this webinar. Thank you, Kate. Well, thank you. I appreciate being on. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.